Alamu Asalan, Marhaban, and welcome to the center uh, where, as our director said, we bring the world to you. Tonight's presentation from our breaking news series is about the nation of Morocco. For many Americans, familiarity with Morocco uh, is through films like Casablanca. Some know it as the former French prote protectorate just across from Sp Spain at Gibraltar. Uh, a few of us, like myself, have actually visited Morocco. In fact, I've been to Morocco twice in 2018, and if you will indulge me, my remarks will be just a minute or two longer than usual. During my first visit there in March, I absolutely fell in love with this country. It is so beautiful. I fell in love with its culture, its language, its people. Uh, they're some of the most warm, welcoming people I've ever met in my life. So based on that experience, I returned there by myself this summer to live in Marrakesh and study Arabic and write poetry because, you know, just do it, right? It was a life-changing experience for me, as I'm sure is not a surprise to you, and I'm devoted to teaching others all that I learned uh, dispelling the myths and misconceptions that we have about Morocco, about North African people, about Islam, and fighting intolerance to the extent that I can. When I planned to visit Morocco, many people asked me if it would be safe, uh, since it is a Muslim-majority country in a region of the world with an Islamic fundamentalist presence. Uh, I never felt unsafe at any point in either of my visits, even when I was an American woman traveling by myself. It is, as Muslim majority countries go, rather progressive. For example, women there are not required to wear a head covering, and no one ever expected me to wear a hijab, a head covering, uh, even when I toured the inside of the Hassan II Mosque in Casablanca. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the experiences of uh, those Moroccans descending from the original indigenous people there, though, has not been so smooth. Uh, you probably know them as Berbers. I don't use that phrase anymore because that is a name imposed on them by European invaders, uh, and it's a word that actually means barbarians. So much like the European uh, imposed term Indians here in the USA that we consider offensive and don't use anymore, uh, the preferred term is and should be Imazirin. My friends who are Amazir have related to me their experience of learning only Arabic uh, in school and of their home languages and culture being virtually erased from their history books. Uh, that's why when you are speaking to me, uh, you'll see on my arm a tattoo of their symbol of freedom and civil rights, a letter from their own language. So the recognition of the languages of the Imaziren, uh, collectively grouped under the common language of Tamazight, uh, has been what I would consider a welcome political change in the last few years, the recognition of it as an official language. And I'm pleased to report, and you will notice one of the pictures in this slideshow, uh, there is uh, much of the signage in Morocco, that one right there, includes not only French and Arabic, but also now Tamazight. Um, it's a concession that the government made that you'll hear more about tonight uh, in, in response to the protests uh, that followed the 2011 Arab uprising. Uh, with politicians responding to people uh, and to popular sentiment in varying ways that are at times maybe merely lip service, but you know at least a response uh, which is, I think, a step in the right direction. And so our speaker, uh, Intasar Fakir, Fakir, is a fellow and editor-in-chief of the online journal Sada uh, in the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Middle East Program, where her research focuses on political, security, and economic change in Morocco and other North African countries, as well as political Islam trends, local governance, social mobilization, and foreign policy. 
Among many other things, she has worked on implementing democracy and education assistance programs in the Middle East and North Africa, and consulted for organizations and companies, and written for news outlets in the USA, Europe, and the Middle East. So please join me in warmly welcoming Ms. Fakir. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, thank you for your extremely useful background and impressive command of Arabic, if I might say. And um, thank you to everyone here in the college for having me. And of course, thank you all so much for coming. It's always a pleasure for me to talk about Morocco. It's one of those countries, as Ellen mentioned, that's not of immediate concern to US audiences. So it's really always a pleasure to be able to talk about all things Morocco. Um, of course, Morocco has been an important ally on a number of issues, uh, an important ally for the US and also for um, Europe, for the US, um, crucially really so for US foreign policy since 2001 and the global war on terror, and for um, EU more immediately for security, migration, but also in terms of um, more broadly regional security. I think it's fair to say that the country is at a really interesting um, geopolitical and geographical junction. Um, it's immediately next to a um, black, black box of a country, that's Algeria, that maintains fewer ties with the West. It's next to a nascent democracy, a nascent but fragile democracy in Tunisia, right up there, that little green corner, if you can see it. And of course, it's a few countries removed from Libya which is engulfed in the chaos of a civil war. Uh, to say really nothing about the sort of turbulent um, Sahel region which, in which you know, lawlessness, um, terrorism really thrives and so on. So overall, in North Africa and the region broadly, uh, which has faced some significant challenges since 2011, Morocco is very much seen and stands out as a ha haven of stability and security. Now what I'm hoping to do today here is look at just how accurate that image is. I want to dig a little bit more underneath the surface, discuss some of the challenges that the country is facing, but also look at some of the opportunities that could um, develop and sustain its future. So before I do that, I want to talk very briefly about what happened in the Middle East in 2011, and more, um, more immediately how 2011 inf unfolded for Morocco, and what the main implications were. Then I will look at the post-2011 power struggle that went on, and we'll look at also some of the social and economic crises that the country has been trying to navigate since. And then we'll sort of juxtapose that a little bit with its foreign policy, and hopefully we can have some concluding thoughts about what's, what's coming next, what to expect for, um, for the country. So very briefly on the 2011 protests, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kind of have this in the background and then I'll move to some of the visual sort of representations of the 2011. Um, you know, the social, political, geopolitical challenges that led to the unrest of 2011 across the Middle East were very much present in Morocco as well. Um, Morocco is a monarchy that um, behaves largely as an autocratic regime, although it has an elected government, an established political party system that dates back to before the independence. But the power has always been squarely in the hands of the monarchy. And here I'm showing, this is really sort of a, a, an embodiment of how the monarchy is in Morocco. That, that little parasol there, that's the symbol of power. And that's the king walking through um, his coronation uh, when he took over in 1999 after his father passed away. So you kind of have this institution that dates back uh, to 1631, has been in power since 1631, and has essentially complete control of the country. And so, as I was mentioning in terms of socioeconomics, the country's development um, was and has been uneven. The rising middle class was feeling choked off. 
And more importantly, people wanted the same dignity and opportunity that we've heard everyone ask for from Morocco all the way to Yemen across the Middle East. So just very briefly, protests broke out in Tunisia, as some of you might, might know, um, after a young man set himself on, on fire um, protesting the uh, police and official treatment of him. Um, this happened in 2010. The protests quickly brought down the entrenched um, autocratic regime um, of, um, of Ben Ali in Tunisia. The same protests spread to Egypt. They also brought down the President Hosni Mubarak. In Libya, likewise, Muammar Gaddafi's rule, which had always been very secure, suddenly seemed jeopardized, and so did Ali Abdullah Saleh in, in Yemen and Bashar al-Assad in Syria and so on and so forth. What was clear is that these ruling establishments were essentially struggling, each in their own way, to maintain their hold on power. Now, in Morocco, protests were brewing, um, and, in two th and in February 20th, the largest one took place. Uh, these protests, like I said, much like the rest of the region, were organic, only loosely organized. In Morocco, the group that sort of organized these protests on Facebook, Twitter, so on, calling people to uh, come out and protest, um, named themselves February 20th after the day when they um, initiated their movement. And they linked up with other actors from across ideological um, convictions and, of course, the average citizen that wanted to voice their, their, their dissatisfaction. One thing that I will say about the protests in Morocco is that it was very clear from the beginning that the goal was not to bring down the monarchy. Um, the goal, rather, was to see greater political freedom, to see greater transparency and accountability, all of which would hopefully bring about greater economic opportunity and greater development. I think the monarchy, having seen the domino effect of protests and, and, and then revolutions across the region, uh, really felt, okay, well, we have to figure out a different way to proceed. Um, so the difference in outcome for Morocco, the reason why I think we don't see it um, you know, the way uh, Libya is or, or some, some of the more unstable countries, is the way that the monarchy has reacted. Uh, the monarchy's reaction was different in that within two weeks from the beginning of the protests, the, protests, the king essentially came out and ceded, and not directly to the protests, to the protesters, but generally that reforms were necessary. He said, okay, we need reforms, and I am going to spearhead them. Um, he promised a constitutional revision that would give greater power to the elected institutions, parliament and, and government. And um, then he promised that an election would take place and that greater civil liberties um, would, would, would also be granted. And that all of this would essentially lead to a stable path um, towards reforms. So this seemed to resonate with most people. At least the promise seems to appease the protesters, and the protests essentially began to decline. There were other factors that also contributed to the decline of the, of the protests, but I think for our purposes, I, it's safe to say that there were a lot of people who were very optimistic about what was coming. Um, so the Constitution uh, was passed by popular referendum in July of 2011. Elections soon followed in November 2011 as well. And the election outcome was very much in keeping with the sentiment across the region. Among Morocco's political parties, the Islamist parties, which is called the Justice and Development Party, and you'll hear me refer to it as the PJD, that's their acronym, they came to power in unprecedented numbers. The party won 107 seats out of Morocco's 395. I realize this doesn't sound like a lot, but given the way uh, Morocco's electoral laws are designed, this is quite a bit. Um, and so they, this essentially meant that for the first time, an Islamist party would be leading the Moroccan government. And I just want to say a quick thing about the vote for Islamists. I, I think it's very much, it was very much a vote against the entrenched elite rather than a vote for the Islamists. Um, in that sense, the vote brought the Islamists to power, but they were always in the opposition, right? They were not seen as part of the sort of ruling elite in Morocco. Morocco, as I mentioned, has a diverse and fractious party system. 
And parties through, throughout their experience um, since the independence have come to be seen as tamed or, or co-opted by, uh, by the monarchy. The monarchy had sort of effectively capitalized on these actors' self-interest, um, their infighting, and has weakened them. Um, but the Islamist party, at least in Morocco, had a slightly different reputation. They were seen as hardworking. Their MPs, when they were in, in parliament, they would actually attend sessions, they would vote, they would write laws, they, they, they took th this work much more seriously. They were also seen as more honest civil servants because of their piety. And the Islamist party in Morocco is really the most well-organized party. They have very strong bylaws, they're democratic in how they apply those bylaws. So in that sense, it has a much better um, reputation. Of course, we're talking about uh, essentially people seeing them as the lesser of all evils, but I think it still sort of matters in, in kind of thinking about how they came to power post-2011. Um, and I think it really, again, it really says a lot less about sort of what this means for the country's religiosity and, and more about what this <laughs> reflects on the country's uh, sort of political elite. Uh, so with the constitutional revisions, the election, the Islamists in power, the protest had calmed down. And really the big story now was the Islamists in power and not so much whether the monarchy or the system would be threatened by the 2011 protests. So the monarchy was safe, the government was freely elected, and um, at least in principle, we were going to see the government have a little more power in terms of running the country. Now after 2011, um, this really, it started to feel um, like this was changing a little bit. I, I, I'm gonna pause here and just say a couple things about this picture. That is the king, that's the king of Morocco, and that right there is the prime minister. He is the head of the Islamist party that is now uh, in leading the government coalition. Um, so again, they come into power and things you know, seem a little like, okay, these concessions that they got, where they are, are, how are we going to see the extent to which they would be applied? So I would say that really the struggle for the post-2011 period, certainly from 2011 until 2016, which was another election, was basically the struggle about the actualization of the constitutional reforms passed in the summer of 2011. What began to change though is that I think the monarchy sort of felt, was beginning to feel a little more secure and they said, okay, maybe we don't have to give the government, now that it's led by the Islamists, maybe we don't have to give them all of the things that we promised we would give them as part of the constitutional changes. So you sort of saw throughout this period, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail, of course we can talk about this in the Q&A if there's any interest, but what you saw from 2011 is this kind of back, sort of pull and push between an Islamist-led government and a monarchy. Um, you know, the, the PJD's efforts to assume the new powers granted to the government and parliament would effectively influence the balance of power, right? Um, and this worried the monarchy and created significant tension about the scope and extent of the reforms that the government wanted to pass. Now, in managing this tension, this man right there, Abdel Ilab bin Kiran, he had sort of an interesting approach to this. Usually politicians are very deferential to the king. And he did that, but what he also, he also is, he is very much a populist. And a populist not in a bad sense. He doesn't sort of you know, try to divide people, rather he kind of tries to make it seem that politicians are much closer to people. You know, he's, he's there, he's of them, he wants to listen to them. But at the same time, he's very deferential to the king. So, He's the older gentleman there. Yeah, on, on your left, my right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what he did is that he really tried to find a diplomatic way of highlighting the, you know, the limitations that he faced. And this kind of served two distinct purposes, as I was saying. It clarified to the people where his authority ended. I mean, There's a little bit of confusion about just how much power the government has at this point after the, the constitutional reforms. So he, you know, he would go out and say to people, look, I have the best of intentions, but my mandate here is limited. You know, there's not much I can do and so on. 
And, and this served a couple of purposes. One, it really helped insulate him from popular um, anger. People couldn't really blame him for a lot of the failures of the government. But it also reassured the monarchy. It sort of made them think, OK, this guy is still differential. We don't have to worry about him um, really just yet. But um, by 2015, by 2016, it was becoming clear that he was getting very popular and that the party, despite their very limited performance in government, when you look at what they actually did, it was not a whole lot, that they were getting popular. And so in 2015, a local and a, um, a provincial election took place and they were able to really gain a strong foothold in Moroccan administration. They got deeper into the administration. So there were Islamists everywhere. <laughs> um, and then in 2016, October 2016, um, again, they had a pretty significant showing in the election. Um, they were able to win an even bigger plurality of seats uh, than they did in 2011. Now, this began to really concern the palace, um, who had decided to weaken them. Um, not only were they seemingly popular, they were also now gaining greater legitimacy and greater access to administration. Um, through some clear manipulations, the palace created, essentially created a hostile environment for the party. They made it so that they could not form a ruling coalition. Um, the various political actors, through, I think, pressure and sort of you know, cajoling from the monarchy were very reluctant to go into a coalition, a coalition with the PJD, even though they had a clear electoral win. Um, so after months of stalemate, the party leader, that man right there, um, was pushed out and the party appointed a different um, prime minister who was a much more amenable figure within the party. He was a little bit less confrontational and he essentially agreed to go into uh, a, co a, a coalition government where his party was weak. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit why that's important um, moving forward, particularly in terms of what is going to start rising um, in terms of social protests and, and some um, social instability. So, <clears throat> After this episode of, two, of sort of the, the country essentially going six months without a government, the party that, legi that legitimately won the election being forced into a weak government, it really became very clear that the palace is going back to stripping the political process of any consequence, right? Um, the electoral process now seems perfunctory and consequential, and it kind of undermines the elected, the elected officials and by doing that, the monarchy effectively removes any buffer between it and, and greater you know, popular anger. So with, with that, with politicians and, and the elected institutions completely undermined, the palace is going to have to directly contend with greater um, popular understanding of and potentially anger at its reluctance to reform. And I think that was sort of what was happening a little bit in 2016. Um, so against this backdrop um, of political, you know, political stalemate, maybe even a crisis, social unrest was growing, um, not as a direct reaction to the political crisis, but, but also not completely divorced from it. Um, I'm going to go here and show you. Um, I wonder, is there a way I can go back to the previous slide, Ellen? Previous and then the one before that. Okay. Um, so I will. I, I want to talk a little bit about, as I mentioned, that some of the protest movements that were beginning um, to really crop up across the country since two, since 2016. And I I kind of want to explain a little bit what are some of the socioeconomic um, issues that drive these, and they're very much the same that had brought people out to the street in 2011. Um, they're, they're, what was even more frustrating is that for, for Moroccans 
on the one hand, their country seems to have a lot of promise, right? The economy is growing. Uh, GDP was at GDP growth was at four percent in 2017. The government is able to bring in a lot of foreign direct investment um, in a number of industries, um, and a couple of standout ones are the automotive industry, um, the aerospace industry, and of course renewable energy. And I I'll, I'll just point out this little solar complex here. It's not little. I think it's the largest one in Africa. This um, is one of um, Morocco's most promising um, endeavors, really, which in, in renewable energy. And it's not just uh, solar energy, but also um, wind. And this seems to be one of the things that the, the government very much looks to to kind of show the degree of, of, of promise that the country's economy has. But on the other hand, many in the country are still struggling. Unemployment is still high. Poverty rates are considerable. I think there are something like 4 million people living under the poverty line. And of course, illiteracy rates are still very high. It's something like 32% of the population is still illiterate, and it's even higher in rural areas. Um, unemployment nationally is around 10%, and among youth, it's reached something like 30%. And this is not just rural versus urban. This is also within, um, uh, within cities. Uh, and of course, there are significant chunks of the country where there is no clean running water, where villages, there are hundreds and thousands of people do not have access to roads or schools or hospitals. And um, you, know, you essentially find um, towns where there are luxurious villas surrounded by shanty towns. Uh, where people struggle to feed themselves. And I just want to have these two pictures kind of juxtaposition that we're talking about. That's a very fancy mall in Rabat where you see kind of luxury clothing lines and, of course, remote villages that don't have sewer systems and um, running water. So this duality is endlessly puzzling and frustrating um, to most Moroccans. In addition to this, the average Moroccan is convinced that their political system Political institutions are either incapable or simply unwilling to run the country more effectively, that they're driven by corruption, um, greed, and self-interest. So we have seen since 2011 a notable uptick in protests against these issues. Of course, the country, um, I, I want to show this chart. This is um, ACLID data. I think this is really sort of a great visual representation of what I'm talking about. See, the country has always had protests. You see since 2011, that's the spike of the 2011 protests. And then the kind of baseline continues to be high. And then they rise up again in 2016, which is the reef protests, which I'll talk about just now. And then uh, a couple of other protest movements. Um, the most significant protests were really the reef protests, which you'll see right there, maybe right before 2017, that sort of high spike right there. These protests started when a young man, he's a fish vendor, was crushed in a garbage disposal at the hands of local um, security uh, personnel. This was in summer of, two, or actually fall of 2017. His grotesque death really set off a wave of protests that swept across the north of the country. Um, their, their birthplace was Hosema which uh, Hosema and the entire Reef region has kind of a unique history in, 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 in Morocco. Uh, the region was the site of severe repression from the previous king. Uh, he saw them as the inhabitants of that region as rebellious, separatists, and has essentially since neglected them. So that's the north is one of the regions in Morocco that's you know least served. Um, so of course, there, this, this wave of protests really set off um, bigger concerns and brought to the fore a lot of the frustrations and challenges that people see. Um, another wave of protests that have not had the same longevity or persistence of the reef protests, are, but, all, but are also significant, are the Jrada protests. Uh, this was also in the northeastern region of Morocco. Uh, Jrada is a coal mining town that had died off as the government had either shut off or sold off its mines, they were no longer profitable. But the local population was never really offered an economic alternative. So they continued to struggle, especially the youth. Uh, 
Uh, when the government moved on, they never really figured out how to try to make this city or this entire region um, kind of adapt to the changes. So many people kept mining in, in ad hoc, hazardous um, circumstances. And in February, actually in December, one miner died. One miner, uh, in December 2017, one miner died, and I think another one, or maybe two more, also died in, in um, February of 2018. And again, another wave of protests uh, set off. So these are some of the more notable ones. Um, there are, I think there have also been a few other protests in, um, in other towns. Again, people don't have access to hospitals, so their children die from perfectly easy to prevent uh, you know, diseases and, and, and injuries, so you kind of have a protest there. This uh, is an image of the reef protests that happened in 2016, that started in 2016. Uh, these are people in the streets of Hosema. And this is the young man who was crushed in the garbage disposal. And um, these are some of the other protests in 2017 and then one more in 2018. Um, another example that I'll give before I switch gears to talk about foreign policy is a, um, a national boycott that has been happening since April. This. Um, Boycott has targeted three large companies um, that are owned or operated by people who are close to the monarchy and those and have significant power over um, the economy and politics. And really the ties sort of exemplify the influence of business over politics and vice versa. Um, of course, I talked about the drivers, uh, the socioeconomic drivers of unrest, but also at the heart of this frustration is the lack of accountability. People don't know who to hold accountable for their lack of progress. But with greater political awareness across the country, um, the palace and I think also the elected officials have to contend with greater popular understanding and again, anger at their reluctance to reform. I'll just say one more thing about the reef protests is that they sustained for a long period. They started in October 2016 and it's only very recently that they've stopped. And I was talking to some of my friends, and I said, well, are, are people still going out and protesting? And they essentially said, well, the government has arrested them all, so nobody, <laughs> nobody is able to come out and protest. Um, it really took some significant um, state uh, crackdown to essentially stop people from going out on the streets. But of course, this does not take care of the ongoing social frustration um, and I think we're probably going to continue to see that a lot more. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about um, foreign policy, because I think it's the, 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 the sort of shaky domestic situation is really interestingly juxtaposed with a more aggressive foreign policy approach that Morocco has been pursuing for um, the past few years. For some context, I'll just say here that really the main driver of Morocco's foreign policy is the Western Sahara issue. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it. Um, but the issue also has significant implications domestically. Um, domestically, the monarchy has staked a lot of its legitimacy on this, um, on this issue. Their claim that they were able to basically reclaim that area of Western Sahara is um, one of their biggest accomplishments over the past um, 100 years. So here is a picture of the Western Sahara area that I'm talking about. Do you see that dotted line there? This is where the international, internationally recognized borders of Morocco are, but Morocco claims all of that. This is an area, all of the sort of yellow area is an area that Morocco annexed in 2015. But since they've built a wall, it's called the berm right there, that's a defensive wall against um, the attack from the indigenous population that wants um, independence. And effectively, Moroccan control is really on that side of the berm, which is really the most useful area of the Western Sahara. The rest of it is sort of no man's land. So that's, uh, that's what that looks like. And I will just say here, kind of going back a little bit, that. Um, the Western Sahara is one of the few remaining colonial era territorial disputes that's still being worked out. It pits Morocco against the Polisario right there, 
the Polisario is the Sahrawi liberation movement supported by Algeria. And Sahrawis are the people indigenous to that area. Um, they're supported by Algeria. Of course, there's a lot of bad blood between Morocco and Algeria that even predates the issue of Western Sahara. Um, but the dispute at this point has, it's, it's so entrenched and it has such different implications and meanings for each side. Morocco sees the Western Sahara as an integral part of its territory. Algeria sees the issue through the lens of incomplete decolonization. So it supports the Sahrawis' right to self-determination. Of course, Algeria's own um, sort of national consciousness has very much to do with uh, the post-colonial struggle, the, the, the decolonization struggle. So in that sense, they, they sympathize and they support the Sahrawi cause. But also, they, they very much use it as a, as a sort of leverage against Morocco as a way to curb Morocco's regional influence. Um, since 2007, uh, Morocco has been championing uh, what they call the autonomy plan, which um, as a solution to the crisis. Before that, Morocco had wanted the entire Western Sahara to be an sort of effectively part of Moroccan, under complete Moroccan control, and the Polisario wanted um, independence. Um, both of, ni neither of these were really tenable, so Morocco came up with this autonomy plan where it promises to give greater independence to the region, as part of a broader decentralization plan that it has for the entire country. Now, um, just a, cu a couple of words about, I mentioned the tense um, Moroccan-Algerian relations. As I mentioned, they're, an under, they're one of the underlying um, causes of the issue, and of course, a main impediment to a resolution. Um, in terms of what Morocco expects from its international partners as far as this issue goes, and this will be important when I talk a little bit more about EU-Moroccan relations, is um, you know, Rabat wants de jour recognition for its de facto control of that part. Um, but they've sort of said, okay, while this issue is being worked out at the UN, we're just happy to have Europe and also the US kind of tacitly accept our de facto control over the area. Um, Europe's position on Western Sahara issue has remained purposefully vague. Um, the word I have here is ambiguous. The EU institutions, um, they say that they support the UN-led process, and so do individual um, countries, uh, member states. And of course, while none of the EU partners acknowledge Morocco's legal claims over the territory, um, France, and to some extent Spain, they give implicit backing to Morocco's position. The US's position is similar um, as well. They support the UN-led negotiation process, uh, but of course that has amounted to nothing. Um, I think some US officials have indicated that they like the autonomy plan and they see it as maybe the only viable option, but not much has been done to move, um, to move it along. Of course, all of these actors are worried. I mean, I mean it's a, a zero-sum game, really. If you support Morocco, you're going to anger Algeria, which is a, an important regional player. And of course, if you force Morocco to accept a solution that it doesn't want, this, it risks destabilizing it, going back to what I mentioned about the domestic legitimacy that the monarchy derives from this issue. So that's really how complicated and in sort of a very unsatisfying way this issue is. Um, but really, on, on, on the Western Sahara issue, uh, Moroccans inter Morocco's international partners have all treaded very, very carefully. Uh, of course, at times, much to, this, to the disappointment of Morocco. So driven by these frustrations that Morocco has been facing with its European and American partners, they've really been trying to orchestrate a return to the African Union, um, hoping to gain influence there to help support um, some of their efforts to reach a, uh, a solution to the Western Sahara issue. So this approach was really validated by some re recent tensions with its EU partners in 2015 and 2016. EU uh, Moroccan relations have always been very strong, but they really reached a breaking point in 2015 and 2016. There were two court rulings that very much rattled the relationship. Um, the court rulings essentially declared that Economic agreements, and I think the more relevant ones here are the fishing, fisheries agreement and the agricultural agreement. The fisheries agreement much more so because of the coastline there. 
they, the EU court essentially said these agreements should not include the Western Sahara territory because that's non-self-governing. The agreements weren't concluded without any consultation with the people. Therefore, they should be null. Morocco was very upset about this, of course, and it led to a suspension of ties uh, with, the EU, with the EU in February 2016. And of course, um, Morocco was very much pressuring for a reversal of the, of the ruling, and tensions kept, kept increasing while Morocco was negotiating a renewal of its fisheries agreement with the EU. Ultimately, Europe really does not have much of a choice because Morocco plays a very important role in the migration issue. Of course, with, um, th there are several passage points on the Mediterranean, Tunisia, um, there's, there, there's, there's been uh, a lot of efforts to kind of tamp that down, the one from Libya as well, and now the Morocco one also has to be, they have to make sure that Morocco is cooperating on that front so that they don't get flooded by migrants, not just from Morocco, but coming in from Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So they essentially, you know, they, they, they're concerned about the migration flows and access to important security information. Part of the suspension of ties Morocco stopped giving them any relevant information. As you know, there is a lot of dual nationals who are suspected of having ties to terrorist organizations. Um, more importantly, Morocco is not quite hampered by the same um, human rights considerations, so there is greater access to information that they can then share with the European Union as far as various um, networks that are suspected of um, terrorist activities. So the EU was able to find a solution, and they allowed Morocco to keep the Western Sahara territory included in the agreement. This could mean that there might be further challenges down the road, but for now, the ties are a little bit on the mend. But even though the ties are on the mend, really what Morocco sort of, the lesson that Morocco gained from this experience was that looking more southward and towards Africa was the right idea. In January 2017, Morocco returned to the African Union after it had left 33 years ago, again over the Western Sahara issue. Um, but to presage this return, Morocco had intensified its investments across um, the continent. Uh, just to, uh, to give you a sense of the sort of flurry of diplomatic and economic activity is from the time Morocco declared its intention to rejoin the, uh, the African Union to the time they actually joined, they signed some 113 accords, memoranda, conventions on various um, economic uh, cooperation with a number of different um, African countries in sectors like banking, telecommunication, agriculture, um, extractive industries, and renewable industry, of course. So, in a nutshell, really, Morocco is trying to gain control over the narrative of the dispute at the AU to supplement its efforts at the UN and um, gain allies on the Western Sahara dispute um, so that it has a little bit more leverage moving forward. So that's essentially what the foreign policy scene is like. Um, I, I mean, it shows a much more sort of forceful approach uh, and, and, and the sense of struggle that you kind of get looking at the, um, at the country, it's much more evident in the domestic scene, um, I would say, than the foreign policy scene. So all of this, you know, what does all this mean? What is the outlook for Morocco moving forward? As I, I think I've been talking for about 40 minutes, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I've laid out a number of reasons to be pessimistic, right? Um, there is unrest, uh, the economy is not producing enough jobs for all um, young people entering the workforce, public administration is ineffective, um, and of course the sense of disenfranchisement is strong and growing. But um, I am optimistic. Um, I have sort of a, a kind of an optimistic final slide. <laughs> I am optimistic about Morocco and my optimism is really about the country's people. And I'll echo a little bit of what Alan said starting. I want to point out that almost all of the protests and, and boycotts and everything that I've talked about has been peaceful. Um, these, these young people who have a lot of reason to be angry really just want a pragmatic solution to their challenges. 
Um, and that, that gives me hope. It gives me hope for the country. It gives me hope for, for the future. So I will close on this hopeful note.